Good morning. Hello. Got some coming up from the back. How's it going, Davey? Good morning. How are you? Awesome. Okay. Well, I have a question for you guys. Um, you know, sometimes there are people that have jobs and they wear certain clothes, and when they wear those, we know that we kind of have an idea of what they do, right? And that those clothes are called a uniform. So can you guys tell me a little bit, like, what are some of the uniforms that you recognize when people wear them? Yeah. A baseball uniform. Excellent. What else? Are y'all awake? Should we get up and do some exercises? Come on now. I know you guys have seen uniforms before. Help me out here. Yeah. Like military or army uniforms, yeah? Do what? A police uniform or a fireman, uh huh. Catching. A what? Catching. A catching? Catching. Oh, church? Churching? Okay, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, there's all sorts of, yeah, but, but look, Pastor Steve and I have a uniform we wear, too. We have a collar that we wear, and um, although my shirts are kind of prettier than his, I think, because they have collars, but it's just me, I'm just saying. Um, but we have uniforms that we wear, and when people wear those, they know who we are. Now, we just listened to a Bible verse that talked about the armor of God, the armor of God. Who wears armor? Like, it, like, think about this. This is the armor of God, but in, in the world, it, 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 knights, right? Yeah, knights use their armor. And so they'd have help. And we, so we learned about a helmet of righteousness and a breastplate, or, sorry, a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness, and a shield. Is my microphone being funky? Okay. And we have a belt of truth. And we have shoes that'll take us wherever we need to go, and probably, hopefully, they're comfortable walking shoes, because if we need to go lots of places to tell about God's love, we need to have some comfortable shoes, right? Now, have you guys ever seen anybody walking around wearing this uniform? Anybody, anybody out there? Anybody seen anybody walking around wearing this particular uniform? No, not really. So if this is not what we really wear to show that we follow Christ, what do you think our uniform looks like? A fireman, a fireman, wears, yeah. a fireman wears a uniform, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you, this is a hard question, so I'm going to tell you. We are already wearing it. Our bodies are our uniform. Just like Jesus was a person in the flesh, so are we, and we use our bodies as our uniform to tell others about God and the world, and to share God's love with others. So it's important that we use our bodies, our voices, our eyes, our arms to hug people or help people or our feet to take the good news of Jesus to people. All of those are the ways that we use our body for God's work. So I hope you will join us in a couple weeks for God's work, our hands, but honestly, we're doing God's work every day. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for giving us bodies to do your work. Help us to remember that our bodies are our uniform, that we are just like your son Jesus in the flesh and blood, and all we need is what you have already given to us. We thank you for this gift. In your name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, so we are now in the fifth week of John 6 about the bread of life. Five weeks of the same gospel, basically. We're in the third week of three of those readings where Jesus tells us about um, all, like all of the listening disciples, all of the followers, all of the Jewish leaders in the temple, all like that if they eat this bread of life, like Christ's body, Christ's blood, that they'll be with him for eternity. 
So in spite of all this, five weeks of the same lesson, three different times, that, different ways that Jesus has said, eat my body, eat my blood, let me be very clear on one thing today. Jesus is not a cannibal. Nor does Jesus mean for us to be cannibals. Yes, Jesus does use the words flesh and blood. And yes, those words can sometimes be very shocking when we hear them in the context of this text and when we discuss them and read them in church. But perhaps that comes from our culture and our, our sort of life that needs to not be very messy. Um, we kind of, it's, it's interesting, we have this disdain for the discussion of blood. We don't like to think about um, blood that we see or experience out on the streets, which I find really ironic because we live in a world also that pretty much celebrates blood and guts in the movies, in TV, in video games, very graphic, shocking violence. Much of, which, much, of which, much of which we also have to suspend our disbelief to uh, be able to watch. So we see it all the time. Maybe we are a little desensitized. And so then when we actually see it really happening or we actually talk about it happening, it's a little bit creepy, icky, scary. So when we hear this passage about Drinking Christ's blood, eating Christ's flesh, it makes us squirm a little, doesn't it? Even back in Jesus' day, in a time where this religion was actually still very bloody, people came and bought their sacrifices and took them to the altar and sacrificed them for atonement for their sins. There's blood spattered all over the altar. Even then, the people got a little squirmy when Jesus talked about his own flesh and blood. So I wonder why is this? Is it because it's too close to our own experience of life in flesh and blood? Is it because we can look at and touch and feel our own bodies? All of a sudden, the reality of Christ in the flesh and the blood becomes real in a startling way, the humanness of Christ. Because now we can imagine more clearly how strange it would have been for him to stand in front of a crowd just like I do today, but for him to say, eat my flesh, drink my blood. How scary, how weird, and how painfully that flesh and blood would respond to a very violent death. And why? Why would God do this? Why would, God, why would flesh and blood be so necessary for us? And I'll say perhaps the answer lies in a comment by Kathleen Norris. She describes in her book, Amazing Grace, um, I am thinking of a comment of Flannery O'Connor, a devout Roman Catholic made when Mary McCarthy con condescended to call the Eucharist a symbol. O'Connor had responded, well, if it's a symbol, to heck with it. I changed his word a little. That's not exactly what he said. But I find, she says, I find O'Connor's stance a much less literal and more comprehensible understanding of a sacrament and symbol than of a friend who abandoned conventional Christianity because the blood symbolism seemed a form of cannibalism. So in other words, we cannot pare down this concept of sacrament. Otherwise, why would Christ's death in flesh and blood matter? Couldn't matter as much just as a symbol, could it? She also writes on the subject of blood, the human Jesus, blood and all, is the very word of God. Human blood is holy because Jesus was human. And blood includes us in incarnation. It's not so crazy after all, but an ancient thing and wise. The rhythm of life that we carry in our veins is not only for us, but for others, as Christ's incarnation was for the sake of all. <clears throat> no, Jesus was not a cannibal, nor does he expect that of us. But eating his body and blood, while, seemingly a, great, while a seemingly great metaphor, is, is truly more than a metaphor. For communion to be a symbol, it takes away the sacrament, the holiness. When it's just a symbol, it takes away that holiness. So while we don't 
eat actual flesh and blood, we also don't eat just a symbol of flesh and blood. When we take communion, when we follow this command that Christ has given us in this story, we fully embrace Christ's humanity, Christ's humanity as our own. And at the same time, we allow Christ to fully enter into us as that which is and which makes us holy. In communion, we are offered a close, intimate relationship with Christ and our Creator. Holy, sacramental incarnation. And now, of course, there are many other stories of how we should follow Christ and remain steadfast. From our Old Testament reading of that generation um, after Moses, the generation that followed Joshua into the promised land, and Joshua pledges uh, his house, as for me and my house, we will uh, remain, God's, God will remain in our house, and that whole generation follows the Lord as well, and they remain steadfast to God. Um, to another New Testament story or metaphor, including today's reading from Paul, Paul says to put on the whole armor of God. Of course, as we talked about in the children's sermon, we don't wear a uniform, we don't actually wear armor, and yet we do. Our bodies are our uniform, as Christ offered God's love in flesh and blood, so we too offer Christ's love with our own flesh and blood. In remaining steadfast, we live in a way that shows Christ to others, strong and faithful, righteous, shining Christ's light to others. Yet all the while, we remind ourselves that this is only because Christ is within us, in our very flesh and blood, incarnation. Christ's flesh and blood is our flesh and blood. In communion, we are made holy as Jesus is holy. We take Christ into us, and we wear that for all the world to see. So now taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen.